Welcome to today's special event, Walden Pride for Pride, a discussion on culturally competent care. From all of us here at Walden University, we thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us. On the screen in front of you, you'll see the main presentation, a chat window, and a section for submitting questions. You can size these windows as you see fit, so feel free to set them to your comfort level as we move along. The chat window is an area for you to connect with fellow attendees. To submit questions for the panelists, please use the Q&A window. To enable closed captions, you can click on the closed caption button in the lower right corner of the media player window, just to the left of the volume slider. If the media player is not open for you already, you can open it at any time using the toolbar at the bottom of the screen. With those items out of the way, it's my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Walden's Director of Diversity, Inclusion, and Organizational Effectiveness, Bettina Strait. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I am thrilled to be with you and to have this topic of conversation wrapping up our month of celebration for Pride. I have information to share with you about my two colleagues and um, we are really excited and looking forward to the interaction with our, with our audience and also just to provide some great information. So I am going to first introduce myself. I am Bettina Strait. I'm the Director of Diversity, Inclusion and Organizational Effectiveness, as you just heard. I've been with Walden since December of last year and um, I'm coming to you from both a background in higher education and then 13 years in healthcare, working in HR, training and development. So um, when those two worlds provided an opportunity to work here at Walden, I was really um, anxious and eager to join in conversations just like this, especially knowing how many clinicians we have amongst us as students and practitioners. So I'm going to introduce my two colleagues and give them a chance to also share some additional information about themselves with you. So I blew it up big enough that I didn't have to use my glasses. So I'd first like to introduce to you Lee Westgate, MBA, MSW, LCSWC, owner of some amazing hair and a board certified clinical supervisor in the state of Maryland. He obtained his master's in social work at the University of Maryland School of Social Work and a master's in business administration with a focus on leadership and management at the University of Baltimore. He currently serves as a clinical instructor at the University of Maryland School of Social Work. He's participated in CSWE sponsored National Trauma Task Force work group that focused on the intersection of ethics and trauma informed practice. Additionally, he was awarded an immersion fellowship through Boston University to study addiction and behavioral health. I am very pleased to say that Lee and I have been friends for years having worked together and I would like to give him an opportunity to share a bit more about himself with you. Thank you very much, Bettina, my friend, and thank you to my new friend, Mark. I'm very glad to, to be here with, with everybody. Um, in addition to all the student loans that uh, Bettina disclosed that I have, um, I am a, a trans man, an educator and clinician and advocate. And so I, uh, I fully intend to bring both lived experience and also share and lift up the lived experience of my patients that I've had the privilege to serve. So thank you so much for giving me the chance to be here. Absolutely. And now I'd like to present and introduce to you Dr. Mark Leggett. Mark lives in New Orleans, Louisiana, and has been a core faculty member at Walden in the School of Counseling for almost seven years. Before coming to Walden, he taught for 11 years in the counseling program at the University of Alabama. Mark has been in private clinical practice working with the LGBTQ plus community for 21 years. His area of clinical focus is depression, anxiety, grief and loss issues and relationship issues. He served as president of the LGBTQ plus counseling division in the state of Alabama and is currently the president of his division in Louisiana. And again, Mark, I would love for you to share more about yourself with our audience. Thank you, Patina. It is my pleasure to be here with both of my panelists and with all of you. Uh, I am a gay man uh, living in New Orleans. I'm a counselor educator and a private clinician, um, having been in practice in Tuscaloosa, Alabama for a number of years and then here in New Orleans for the past five years uh, and then teaching with Walden um, for about seven years. So it, it's a pleasure to be here today to, to talk about such an important topic. 
Absolutely. So just to give the audience an idea of kind of the flow of things, um, all three of us will be sharing perspectives, experiences, hopefully some knowledge and takeaways with you. Um, personally, as a lesbian who has worked in healthcare and has been married to my wife for 13 years, we um, have experienced positive and negative experience, you know, situations in clinical care um, for both of us. And so I look at it also as someone who trains providers and clinicians. I didn't touch a patient, but I worked with the people who did. And so all three of us are coming from both personal and professional experiences that we hope can illuminate um, and provide you some insight into what it really can be like for those of us who are members of the LGBTQ population to enter into a healthcare relationship with providers. So the first question that I'll pose, and I'll, I'll address this to Lee to start off, um, is in your professional experience, what does culturally and clinically competent care look like when you're working with our particular community? I really appreciate that you started with the easiest question. Um, you know, this is a question that, that I get a lot. So, you know, one thing I didn't get a chance to share a moment ago is I teach the only uh, clinical class at University of Maryland around supporting LGBTQ plus folks. And so a lot of the discussion is what does affirming care look like? And in, in preparation for that question, I wanted to actually answer it this way in terms of distinguishing something that I think a lot of us do that, can, that is conflated with affirming care. I think that it's really important to know that there's a difference between um, sort of friendly care and affirming care. And I really want to talk about that distinction because there are many folks um, who are friendly to LGBTQ plus patients, but are not really embodying the skill sets and the things that constitute affirming care. And so, so one thing I think that's a critical difference is that when you're providing affirming care, it's not just about recognizing that we exist, but it's about anticipating and preparing care settings to um, to not just accommodate, but to anticipate needs that are differential for LGBTQ plus populations. And, you know, that really looks like recognizing that, you know, LGBTQ plus affirming care is, it's not a specialty practice, right? And so many times um, we think about this as a specialty type of care that you need to go to a certain place or a certain clinic. And the, the issue with that is, that it creates all sorts of access challenges. So I think the first part of affirming care is really recognizing that this is an essential skill set. Um, I think the second thing is affirming care recognizes that traditional medical models um, are often, you know, very um, pathologizing of LGBTQ plus folks. And you know, we when we when we provide affirming care, we really have to look at the way that our patients are moving through the system and think about how do we welcome, how do we assess for, how do we think about differential family arrangements, relationship arrangements. Um, the provider is well researched, they've done their homework. And I think that that last part is so essential because in friendly care, a lot of times patients are, are put through the process of teaching the provider. And that's one thing I hope that we can dialogue a little bit about um, this evening is that affirming care recognizes that the patient is there to receive care, not to educate the provider. And I think that is, for me, a really important paradigm shift in practice. Um, and then the last part is really, as the provider, you have to really scrutinize your own practice and think about how are you managing your bias, your anxiety, um, you know, how are you ensuring that you're removing barriers and not creating new ones. So those are, I think those are really important um, paradigm shifts that providers have to negotiate to, to reform our, our models of care. Thank you. So I, I want to be sure I, the greatest part of sessions like this, and also the most challenging is that I hear an answer and I want to go down another path to follow up on things, but I also want to keep us on task. So thank you for that. That's given me a lot to think about and some things to jot down. Um, Mark, how about you? What, it, what do you feel like affirming, and I love that, competent care looks like for our community? Thanks, Bettina. And, and I, I appreciate really what Lee said about the, the difference in being nice uh, and being friendly versus really understanding how to properly work with uh, individuals from our community. 
uh, being from the South uh, and, and having been born and raised in Mississippi, I know all about being real nice and, and how easy it is to, to demonstrate that. But there's a difference in being kind uh, and being sincere and authentic and, and genuine and compassionate with the people that we're working with. And when I think about the, the field of mental health and counseling, uh, it takes such courage uh, to make that phone call uh, for an appointment with a therapist and, and to, to go in and, and really that affirming care begins with the, the immediate first contact that we have with a client, um, whether it's on the phone or whether it's when they enter our office and if they're dealing with us directly or if they're dealing with, with personnel that we have hired, receptionist or, or office staff, and that first contact, how they're greeted, how they're treated, uh, the documents that we provide for them to complete, uh, and, and making sure that they feel affirmed, welcomed, and understood from that first step. And then, and then entering into the space with us as the professional. Um, and some of the very basic skills that we teach in, in the School of Counseling at Walden, being compassionate and, and respectful and sensitive to that person's needs um, but as Lee said, it's it, on so many levels, it's 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 threefold, uh, beginning with an, an awareness and an understanding of our own bias, our own cultural background, the influences that we had growing up that have had an impact on how we view the world and how we treat others. And then understanding where our clients are coming from and uh, particularly our community and the oppression and discrimination that takes place and, and understanding those barriers and, and what our clients experience every day. Those aspects help us connect more authentically with, with our clients. Thank you, Mark. I, one of the things that really stands out to me and, and some of the work that I've done training different organizations is that often they feel overwhelmed because they're just not sure where to begin. They feel like they have to be an expert, a subject matter expert on this on this community and, and really can sometimes feel tripped up um, not knowing. And often what I share as a reminder is just what you said, that compassion goes a long way. I, I train on making sure you're maybe, you know, can you drop some of the assumptions that you make when you're conversing with a potential patient and not speaking to someone who looks like me and at saying anything about a husband or look something someone who looks like you mark and assuming that there's a wife in this situation things like that and, and neutralizing some of those things but then beyond talking about you know getting to know your patient understanding their family situation being able to say okay now that you know now that we've met and, and i understand some of these dynamics how do you prefer to be referred to? How does your spouse prefer? You know, understanding to me when someone asks a question like that, it reminds me, it's a signal to me that they're open and that they're listening and that they're not making assumptions, which is fantastic. I do have a follow-up question that came through and I think it's really relevant specifically to what both of you have shared. Um, where can providers go to get more training on affirming care and LGBTQ needs? Because we all know you may work in an organization currently or be going to work in an organization at some point, and this just isn't a topic that they've approached yet, or this, and this may not be training that they've received. So if either of you have thoughts on that. I can, I can jump in with that and put it in the chat a moment ago. Um, there's a number of really good resources. Um, one, one thing that I think is really important to recognize is that this evening we've already used an acronym and we haven't really unpacked that. We talk about LGBTQ, you know, LGBTQ, LGBTQ+. And so the first thing that I would just share with providers, and I'll, and I'll drop a resource into the chat as well, but the, for providers to really recognize that you know, LGBTQ+, is not monolithic, right? Like we're not all the same, right? That is a you know, umbrella acronym with many, many communities and then sub communities that have differential needs. And so that's really important to recognize. Um, and, you know, when you when you look at health disparities, for instance, there's a lot of overlap. So, for instance, I identified as transgender. I didn't necessarily speak to my sexuality. Right. And so I think it's very important just to recognize that there's multiple identities that can overlap. Uh, for healthcare providers, one really great resource, which I'll, I'll put into the chat, is Fenway. Um, they have a number of 
really great uh, trainings, resources, um, and I would also point to the Human Rights Campaign has created a health equity index that really, um, it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's an evolving um, series of standards of care, but it gives folks kind of a roadmap for what are some fundamental things that practices can do to, to really change the way they operate. And so just like both Bettina and Mark uh, relayed a moment ago, you know, how do we ask questions and things of that nature? Um, one thing I would just also throw out there, and I tell this to my students every single class now, is that everybody has a different starting point. And to be a, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't just say, you know, competent, right? That, but to have humility and practice to recognize what your starting point is and to know that's a normal place to be. Um, but there's a number of good resources and I'll, I'll you know, um, definitely have my colleagues to jump in. And if I have some additional ones, I'll put those in the chat as well. Thank you, Lee. I know I get a lot of questions from folks saying sometimes they're expressing that sometimes they're so afraid of saying the wrong thing that they opt to say nothing at all. And so when say they're looking at a chart and what they assume is a one is a particular gendered name and then the person who walks into the room doesn't match up with what they've assumed they freeze because they don't know how to approach that person and what to say rather than saying i see here that you know you know i see your name is lee is that how is that the name that you prefer to use however sometimes we stumble i'm stumbling right it's it's not a perfect scenario but I know, again, that hearing someone make that effort speaks volumes to their care and concern and their interest in, in knowing and not making assumptions. And so sometimes it's it's also a matter of how do we approach it so that we're at least engaging in the conversation and that, that might be a starting point for some people. And there's a really good thought experiment folks can engage in. And this is the first homework I give to my students where I tell them to do a week without gender. Try to go through an entire week not using gendered terms and switch on that sensitivity factor and start to appreciate that if you are walking through the world, um, again, with, with an identity that is distinct from the norm, how many micro and macro aggressions would you hit right during a given week? So I think sometimes as providers, you also have to do that. But I would also say if I rewrote the next, you know, DSM in terms of diagnoses, I would create a new diagnosis called anticipatory anxiety. That's where the patient and the provider are becoming so nervous about each other that we're not talking. And that's what anxiety does is it promotes avoidance for on both, both fronts. Right. And that's the, that's the balloon we kind of have to pop right in our, in our social. And Bettina, if, if I could go back to that question about, uh, finding support uh, and uh, to learn more about these issues in, in your distinct areas. If you are in the field of counseling, if, if you're a student in counseling, lean on your professional associations. We encourage all of our students to get involved in local, state, and national uh, counseling organizations where you can find resources uh, and, and workshops and trainings and conferences to attend. And, and if you're not in the field of counseling, advocate that your professional organization will provide that for you. Uh, and, and then sometimes you can just Google, uh, Google for organizations in your area, in your city and in, in your community and uh, look for resources that would come to your place of employment, that would come to your organization and provide the training that you need. Thank you both. Again, I think this is really valuable, valuable information. I know that, you know, many organizations that have reached out to me are, are truly Googling. <laughs> they are looking for trainers who specialize. And we, we know that right now this is such, you know, DNI in general is such a topic of interest and importance to people. And so you really would be able to find 
folks who specialize in LGBTQ information, but, but diversity across the board. And so find gaining support within the organization that you are working with, you know, investigate, ask some questions, like-minded people always tend to find one another. And so hopefully you can, you know, pull together some folks who are also interested in and build a case if that's necessary to bring someone in or to start doing some exploration. Um, I shared earlier with this group a, a quick story of a couple who was coming, who was pregnant and looking for some savvy healthcare providers. And they literally called around to a variety of hospitals to find out if their labor and delivery and mother baby units could um, competently care for a mother who does not identify as, as female and who would be coming in also not presenting probably what people were expecting them to as a, as a new mom. And they were fortunate to feel very connected with the care team there. And the care team took it on as their mission from the manager to the clinicians, the, the techs, nurses, doctors, to really learn everything that they could about this unique population, but also just had conversations with the patients, with the mom and, and the partner and, and to talk about what is it that you need from us? How can we provide this? And that interest was critical and, and their outcomes thankfully were, were wonderful and they felt supported and affirmed. Checking the chat to see Local pride centers, that was another suggestion that we have um, to learn more about regional efforts and organizations that are serving this population. And so we, we, we certainly support National Center for Transgender Equality. I know many of you are probably jotting these things down and I think you're probably getting some, um, hopefully some good insights. As a registered nurse, I'm just gonna jump into the chat folks because I feel like this is helpful. Uh, as a registered nurse, what is a respectful way to address biological sexual health with a member of the transgender community? We're really going with the easy questions. I started um, with the easy questions. So, so, so one thing I think is really important to, to keep as a frame of reference is we ask questions that are relevant to care. I think that when you're working with trans patients, it's really important to know that uh, many, many trans folks know about this, and I think it's good for providers to also hear about this. It's called the trans broken arm, arm syndrome. I don't know if people have ever heard of that, but the trans broken arm syndrome means that if I, if I as a trans person come to the hospital with a broken arm, suddenly my care is about me being trans and not having a broken arm. So, you know, I think that it's, it's very important for, for us to ask questions that um, are relevant to care and not things that check a box, right? Um, so when we talk about bio biological sexual health, one thing I think is also really important to know is this is where, and we could have a whole hour long discussion about this, terminology is really tricky, right? Um, so we would want to be very cognizant of not saying like, well, what were you when you were born? Okay, so if you were to ask me, what were you when you were born? I would say I was born a boy, right? That was socialized as a woman that came out as a man, right? So you ask me that question, you're going to get a very different answer, um, you know, and, and also to recognize that certain terminology can only be used by certain folks, right? So as, as a trans person, I might be able to say something like, you know, assigned female at birth, right? I think that that is where you might get into some terminology or some people might say, um, you know, what was your uh, natal sex and those kinds of things. But I think that this is an area to, um, to really start to connect with folks in the community because language is also regional, right? So, and there's a lot of intersectionality that comes into there. So I think that when, when I answer this question, um, I'm answering that from my particular vantage point um, versus, you know, somebody else that may be in a different part of Baltimore, a different part of the country. Um, so I think those are some really important things to, um, you know, to, to follow. And, and I would also put out there that there's, there's really like uh, a scant amount of good research and evidence-based practices that are socialized in medical communities about how to ask questions well around sexual health and wellness. Thank you so much. And one thing that I wanted to bring up, and this actually came up in the chat discussion, is that a lot of this is applicable outside of just a healthcare realm, because we certainly have members of the audience who are not clinicians and who that's not what they're going to school for or not currently their role. And so one example and, and kind of point that came up was 
um, in the classroom setting? How can we be affirming and the kinds of language that can be used? And I, and I want to put a plug in there. Um, there was a Beacons of Light episode. So if any of you from Walden are familiar with this series, a Beacons of Light episode um, that featured Dr. Gina Jacobson, and it was entitled An Academic Path to Pride. Um, and it's available on demand and can be found using a link in the webinar hub. I'm seriously reading all of that because this is the team that helps support all of the back office kinds of things. So absolutely, there are strategies and techniques and things that you can do within any of your communities, within any of your workplaces that can be affirming um, and just really acknowledging that we don't we don't know who in our you know community, who in our classrooms, who in our in our departments, um, identify as what necessarily and whom. And so we want to be really cognizant of that. I'm going to move us to our next question, unless Mark, you had anything, if you're good, I'm going to jump in. All right. So I will pose this to you, Mark, if you don't mind. Um, can you share experiences where you really truly believe that harm was done? because, and, and I know this is sometimes challenging because we don't want to evoke a lot of the struggle all the time, but I think it's really helpful for people to understand how critical this care is. So can you share um, a time when you've seen or experienced how the damage that's done when clinically competent care is not provided? Absolutely, and, and Bettina and Lee, we had spoken earlier just some personal experiences that we have had uh, in the community. Um, I can speak from when before same-sex marriage was was legal. Uh, living in Alabama with my partner and and going to to um, healthcare providers and having to explain what partner meant and who my partner was and and just some of the uh, looks, um, the facial expressions uh, that I would receive would would create such a situation that then I felt so uncomfortable and insecure and even even sharing more about uh, the reason I was there. Um, and that would happen regularly. And and but even more more specifically to uh, the field of counseling and mental health, the number of times that I have seen clients come to me after they had been to a mental health provider and had an experience where they felt unsafe, where they felt judged, where they had come into a situation where there was not compassion, there was not respect. Um, the, the damage that that does, you know, I was talking earlier about the confident, the, the um, courage it takes to make that phone call and, and go to a space where you're going to share some of your most personal uh, emotions, your most personal mental uh, health issues that you're struggling with, and and to be in a situation where you feel judged, where you don't feel accepted fully for who you are, or the wrong kinds of questions are asked, or offensive questions are asked, uh, you you typically won't return to a setting like that. And so it was it was incredible that that some of these clients finally had the courage years later to come back and receive services was amazing. And then the whole the whole issue of conversion therapy, which I think is probably a whole another topic uh, for another night, but the damage that that is doing um, in the field of counseling, it, it is it is a uh, practice that is unethical. It is illegal in many states, but not all. In fact, I think it's only been banned in about twenty three states right now. Uh, and so the 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 I, just the message that that sends to so many. Um, young people, that there is something that can be done to change them, that there is a, a clinical practice that can be used to, to turn them back straight or turn them straight uh, is, is um, unthinkable. Thank you, Mark. Lee, from your perspective and experience, what have you seen as the damage that can be done? This is a difficult question because it wasn't hard for me to come up with like a lot of examples and I'm sure Mark you probably felt the same way like I'm um, even now like I'm like is this the example I'm going to use but um, I wanted to share just an example from being a oncology social worker so I, I was the social worker that worked with folks from the time of diagnosis to the time they went to hospice so if you were my patient you were my patient um, and I started this role in like 2009 and I want to say around 2010 there was a Young, younger patient that came in, she was maybe in her 40s, 
and she came in with someone that she identified as her sister. Um, my immediate gut reaction is there's no family resemblance here, but who am I to say, right? Just something, something was amiss for me, but I, I didn't ask, you know, I accepted with what, what she had presented. And the patient that came in, she had, uh, upon diagnosis, she'd been diagnosed with stage four cervical cancer. And I mentioned this because this is relevant to where the story, the story goes. I worked with this patient for months and I always felt really close to them. Like, you know, just in terms, there was a bond there and, and those kinds of things. And, you know, along the way, I would come to learn that, um, her sister was really her partner. Um, but she was very, they were very like stealth about that because they were from a part of the state where like discrimination was just the norm and they didn't want her to not get cancer care. And they also knew this is before, you know, gay marriage was legal. So they also knew that this person, that if she wasn't identified as her sister, that she probably wouldn't have access to her in the same way. And, um, I mentioned that she had stage four cervical cancer because my patient who, um, you know, who, who was not out to us as the team as lesbian, that's actually unfortunately very common for folks to not get preventative care and to end up with very later stage cancer. So I actually had a number of patients um, whose cancer was really, really caused by the fact that they weren't getting proper preventative care. Um, but the thing that I mentioned about this, the, the reason why this story really sticks out to me, not just because I cared about this patient, but when the patient was transitioning to hospice, you know, this, her, her partner, you know, who had to pretend to be her sister while her partner was like transitioning to hospice. And I can't imagine having to pretend that that's not your person. Right. And just in hindsight, we could have done so much more for the patient and for her, you know, really who was her wife. Right. But they weren't able to marry. Um, but I, I think about that patient at least once a week. And it's part of the reason that I do, you know, what I do. But, you know, I think people outside of care settings have no awareness sometimes of how much patients have to hide because they're afraid they're not going to get the care that they need. Right. And she and her partner should not have had to do that for over a year. Right. To, to pretend. Um, so I think, you know, I could think of lots and lots of situations, you know, um, I can think of situations where, you know, there's been whole arguments on medical teams about whether or not they're going to call the trans patient by their correct name when they're in the ICU. Right. So, I mean, these, these kinds of things, like as a trans person, that's like my greatest fear, right. Entering a care system and like not having my identity respected. But I mean, there are all sorts of things that, you know, range from micro to macro to egregious events that affect folks and like, you know, LGBTQ plus patients oftentimes have to take that because there's not good accountability mechanisms, right? That's why we're having this conversation because we need many people to be helping systems to be more accountable to patients so they can just get care and not have to do that kind of, you know, that kind of labor. Thank you for sharing that. I, I want the audience to know in preparation, we really did all say, my gosh, how do we even, how do we even narrow down to one story, whether it's our own, someone that we know, a patient that we've worked with. Um, I can think of multiple situations where that were just so challenging and, and I often share them not to be dramatic or, or, you know, exaggerating, they are truly situations that are still taking place. And I, I remind myself frequently, I live in Baltimore and I feel like there is progress certainly that's been made. And I, I forget it's, it's easy when you surround yourself with people who are doing this work all the time, it's easy to forget that there are so many people who are, you know, dealing with situations that I would think of maybe having to deal with 10 years ago, but that's their real experience right now, whether it's in a rural area, whether it's somewhere that doesn't have a ton of options, as Lee was mentioning earlier, and in places to get care. Um, I did a training once with an organization and there was an ER nurse who was in the um, session and who really kind of sat like this the whole time. And I knew there was something brewing and they finally said, I just don't believe that I should have to care for a transgender patient. And isn't it my right to say that's not something I'm comfortable with? 
And without going down the long path of where that rationale was coming from for them, the reality is that had they, and uh, uh, to be honest, I believe they actually said GLBT. I think they used the whole, <laughs> the whole acronym. And when I think to myself, what if I showed up in a critical condition or God forbid my wife show up in a critical condition in an ER and was faced with someone who didn't act immediately because I showed up with my wife and a stroke where you need to give a medication immediately or some kind of care that is time sensitive. And we all know in emergency departments, that's often the case to wonder whether or not the person who I would be cared for by is has that mentality and the discussion thankfully by the leadership in that group at the time said you work at an organization that is committed to providing quality care for all who come through and if that's a decision that you would choose to make this may not be the place for you to work but not every organization will have that kind of policy framework commitment and, and it is heartbreaking. I, I'm watching each of us get choked up sharing stories and listening to stories because it is a current reality for so many of us. So thank you both for sharing those situations. And, and, and Bettina, you, you prompted me to think of uh, how many young people who are struggling with mental health issues, anxiety, depression, for example. And, if, and as I mentioned earlier, they they have the courage to take that first step and reach out to a mental health provider. And if that one experience, that one opportunity becomes a missed opportunity because of the, the incompetence of that provider, they, they may never get treated for, for the mental health issue that they're experiencing because of that one experience, that one time they, they had the courage to go and were not treated with care, with competence. Exactly. And, and I think about this kind of in terms of any situation, again, beyond even healthcare, that our, the impact that we can have by how we're treating others, <laughs> known to us or not known to us, and, and any of their multiple identities, has such a can make such a difference. If you're a teacher in a school setting and your, you know, your books are reflective of a wide variety of families, how amazing for us, you know, for a child to see themselves and their family represented in that. I had a, a conversation with some folks recently who were discussing pride and you had a few people who felt frustrated that organizations were putting a rainbow on their logo and saying we're we support pride and people were saying well what are they doing in their policies and procedures and and how are they actually committed to change and someone said to me you know what if i was 10 years old and i saw a gay family in a commercial or converse had rainbow sneakers when i was growing up or the cereal box that i passed in the grocery store with someone on that you know the cartoon character was holding a rainbow flag i wouldn't have been curious about their hiring policies but i would have felt more accepted and to speak to where someone is in their life and in their experiences we just don't know and so it is those are those important moments. What can we do in every interaction to be as welcoming and to be as open? I've got a couple of questions I want to jump to and chat really quickly. Um, Lee, kind of as a follow up, are patients not receiving preventative care because of the anxiety of how they will be treated or viewed? And if so, if you think so, how could we change that? That's a great question. Um, I, I think it's actually a couple of things. Um, one, one is certainly one is certainly anxiety. So let me just, let's normalize anxiety. One great way to deal with anxiety is to avoid things. And a lot of times people don't realize that, like, you know, I think about my own experience growing up. I said no to a lot of things rather than yes, because no was safer, right? And I didn't have to deal with uncertainty and all those kinds of things. That's my lived experience, right? The other thing too, and Mark kind of alluded to this before, um, it is a journey to get to care. Right. So if I think about like, you know, um, you know, an LGBTQ plus patient who maybe is affected by social determinants of health. Right. It's a journey to navigate public transportation, to navigate all these kinds of things. And I think whether you're on the mental health side, the healthcare side, the advocacy side, the first thing you need to really accept is that adversity is the norm. Right. So things are harder. Things are like three times harder. 
Um, in terms of the preventative care, I think it's a lot of things. Um, you know, as a, as, a, as a trans patient, all healthcare spaces are gendered. They're not built for me. So why should I go? Like, honestly, why should I go? It's going to be a headache. It's going to be awful. There's going to be at least five to six microaggressions before I see the doctor. <clears throat> and if I'm a new patient and I haven't been able to communicate with them over, you know, a portal that maybe they check and I've done all that work, it's a lot of work to do that. And when you talk about some preventative care, like specialty care, right? Maybe a person has an endocrinologist, maybe they have someone who's managing sexual health and wellness, right? Like care is not one provider, but it's many providers. And all it takes is one interaction, right? To really reinforce that I should have listened to my anxiety. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I think that that's really, really important. And I think, you know, we're all kind of saying the same thing in the same way. Um, that, you know, affirming care is transformative. But the other thing I think is really important to look for that we haven't addressed yet is, and this is in terms of preparation, part of being an affirming provider is also learning to be trauma-informed. There's a lot of us that have experienced trauma, right? That could be rejection from parents, that could be bullying, that could be a whole myriad of things, right? And when you have trauma and you're an LGBTQ plus person, it doesn't take a lot of like, what we call big T traumas to change our behavior. Um, I'm not going to be super nerdy right now, but you only need a little, uh, like a, like a scotch of trauma, right. To like really kind of affect things. So when you take adversity plus a potential trauma history, plus a hostile healthcare setting, we're not going to go unless our leg is falling off. <laughs> right. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of, you know, delaying of care that a lot of folks will will do. Um, but the other thing, and then this is just in terms of wraparound things to, to think about too, you know, not all LGBTQ plus folks are super resourced. Poverty is actually incredibly common. Housing instability is incredibly common. And, you know, one of the benefits of something like the Affordable Care Act is suddenly Medicaid became accessible to folks but not to all folks. So different people in different parts of the country might be tuning in here right now. In Maryland, I'm a whole person legally, but if I go to a different state, I may not be, right? And so there's this real patchwork of access. And so it's many, many things. And, you know, there's no silver bullet to do that. But, you know, the, the ultimate thing is for providers to not be complicit in bad care. Right. We get all these terrible events that Mark and Bettina and I just alluded to because people were complicit with things going awry. And I think that's the first thing is to be able to talk about us when we're in the room with conviction and do it when we're not. Right. And those things feel really, really essential to to think about. Thanks. I it's such a comprehensive, I love your answers there. They always bring up kind of that next thought of, okay, what can I do now? And just looking at time, we do have a couple of questions, but I want to, I want to make sure that I'm bringing us forward the specific question, and then we can get to um, some of what I've seen in the chat. So knowing that our audience that includes educators, clinicians, care providers, members of our community, such a wide spectrum. Um, what do you think is a purposeful change? And, and we may have covered this, but what do you think is a purposeful change they could make that could have a positive impact on our community? And just briefly kind of following up, Lee, on, on what you're talking about, understanding the rights and laws in your particular state really is critical because what you may think should be available or think should be an option may not be. And knowing is half the battle so that you can be proactive. Um, I had a colleague that I worked with who, because I was in HR, came to me and said, I don't know if you can help me. I am a trans man, but I need gynecological care currently. But my insurance, because I've changed my gender markers, will not cover an OBGYN appointment. So I've changed my name. I've gone through legal steps to have all of have the papers in my world, you know, identify and align with who I am. But now that has a negative impact on the care that's covered. And I cannot receive gynecological care. And the insurance of the company that we worked for 
had hoops to jump through and it was not something that could be included. And so we had to go back and say, could we have an exception? So I use this as an example for those of you who are in organizations where maybe you're unaware of the implications that many of us go through uh, or that experience. Those are really critical pieces. That knowledge is so, so helpful. I can't imagine what it would be like to walk into a care setting and have someone kind of know those answers <laughs> ahead of me asking them. And that that would be incredible. We have so many, we have some great questions. So let me just circle back for Mark. How about I'll, I'll go to you. Um, practical kind of pieces again, those takeaways that that folks right now where they are could implement or begin to engage in that could create a positive health experience for our community. Absolutely. And, and I think I'm so glad you brought up understanding the laws in your community, in your city, in your state. That is critical. And, and that is something that as, as mental health prof professionals, we need to know and understand what barriers and obstacles our clients face. And, and that includes legal barriers. And in the state of Louisiana right now, we have we have just experienced the same as as some of our neighboring states laws trying to be passed to to ban trans young people from playing sports and to to prevent uh, health care for minors who uh, who are trans from the trans community. Uh, Fortunately, it never made it out of committee in Louisiana because of the efforts of organizations, counselors included, who who uh, joined forces and went to Baton Rouge and prevented that from happening. But that's not the case in every state. But you can get involved by writing letters, making phone calls, protesting at your uh, local city hall or local seat of government and letting them know your your uh, beliefs and opinion about uh, some of these laws that are causing so much uh, pain for so many in the LGBTQ community. So we got a comment um, in the chat that I wanted to bring up to the group and I know Lee wants to respond. Um, we have someone in the audience who identifies as a trans man um, and wants to be open in their community, um, shared a desire to be in a, open in a primary clinic in their rural area in the middle of the Bible Belt. And I have to say a couple of folks have asked questions about um, religion being involved. And, and a side note is this was that's a topic that was included in Dr. Jacobson's um, talk and discussion. So we'll refer you to that. But their question is they were afraid that they wouldn't get a good response due to local culture. Um, and Lee, I know you said you wanted to address that. I think this is a, a really good question, um, and I, I felt like it was an important thing to respond to, and I'm actually going to like steal a little bit from Laverne Cox because I feel like some resonance with, with what, what this participant shared. But Laverne Cox said, you know, it is revolutionary for any trans person to be seen and visible in a world that tells us we should not exist, right? And, you know, I think that, you know, coming out and being out, the, the rule of thumb that I, that I do advocate is we act when it's safe to do so, right? Now, it may not be structurally safe for us at any given point. You know, we've alluded to some laws, and in 2021 alone, there's been, you know, more anti-LGBTQ plus laws than we care to stomach, right? So the structure is not going to change. I do think for trans folks living in this moment, it's really important to, be, to find community. It's really, really important, whether that's virtual community, whether that's local community, in order to come out and be out, you need folks around you that are gonna tell you that you're valuable and beautiful and important, right? Because we need to be able to counter the messages that really try to silence us, right? And so that's a really personal decision about being out. And even in this micro moment, if like you're kind of like virtually coming out to the group, like we're so glad you exist. And I think that that's something that all of us can do as affirming providers. We can be excited about the, fir the, the folks that come out to us and let them know that we're really, really glad they're here and they exist. And so that's something that I would just share from my own journey. Like I'm newly out, like I'm baby out, right? Like I'm out light. And but what made it quote easier for me to not feel gender dysphoria, but to feel gender euphoria, right? Because there's all these ways that we diagnose and pathologize ourselves. But 
it's finding community, right? And it's having the, the ability to see a little bit of ourselves in the world. So I'm sending good vibes to you so that, so that you'll know when it's time to do that and when it's safe for you to do so. I appreciate both that comment and the tone that it sets and, and moves us toward as we're, we're winding down. Um, one of the other questions that came out was specific and Mark, this, this I think will be a great question for you. How do we as counselors acknowledge gender identity and sexuality as integral elements of someone's identity without leading the client to believe that we're assuming that their presenting challenge is related to that. So it sounds like Lee, it was almost that broken arm syndrome of, of we want to acknowledge that it's a part of your identity, but we don't want them to, to feel as though we think that's the reason necessarily that they're there. Do you have thoughts on that? Well, I think that comes with the line of questioning. Uh, when you are initially meeting with a client and, and gathering data and, and gathering, they're listening to their story, uh, providing that safe space immediately early on so that they're comfortable enough to to share what their um, the reason that they came um, and, and and not allowing yourself to have that predetermined idea that it might be related to sexual identity or gender identity but it, it could be other issues fantastic i know when I moved back to Maryland from living in New York and sought out, I utilized my EAP at the organization I worked for. Um, I used it in the transition of moving back to a state and, and all of those things. And it didn't happen to be an issue that revolved around my sexual identity. And I appreciated that my um, that that counselor could just kind of, you know, stay on track with what I needed. But I also knew that should issues arise, that she also thankfully would have been a good person to bring those up because she wasn't afraid to discuss it. She asked, "Are there? is there anything that you'd like to share about? And at the time that wasn't a component, um, but had it been, I do know that that was, that I think would have been a positive situation. I'm getting, oh, so I know Lee can see this. Um, someone had asked in Nashville, um, working as a suicide prevention epidemiologist, how can you find data and resources in rural areas that can help improve health equality and healthcare equity. And I know um, Lee had provided a, the Trevor Project has some really great data and information on suicide prevention. I echo the human rights campaign, the HRC. They have a wide variety of resources on um, their website and can actually kind of point you in the direction of healthcare organizations and clinics and hospitals, all kinds of things that provide clinically competent care for the LGBT community. Um, so Can we'll share some of that. One other thing about suicide information that's really important to know. Is that all right? Go ahead. So, so just a, a couple other things in terms of um, suicide prevention, just to, to pull that out, because I know we have different clinicians and providers here. Um, there, there certainly is suicide risk across the lifespan, but especially in adolescence. And one thing that makes these, these, this, this data very murky is there's a disproportionate of folks that are affected, or disproportionate of, uh, percentage of adolescents that are affected by homelessness. And there's also like tons of kids in the foster care system, right? And, you know, data, and this is something that is, is also a takeaway. If we don't learn to ask, we don't actually get to collect data. Right. And so that that's something that's really important to, to also recognize is that, again, there's such a sparse amount of, of specific research, um, you know, that, that that really focuses on LGBTQ plus folks. And so, like, even our concept of data is very murky. Right. Um, and again, when you're looking at these looking at these data, it's very important to look at different groups. Um, you know, and not to conflate them in terms of how you're interpreting that, but specifically, um, really, really try to pay attention to age brackets and age groupings because that's very, very relevant in the study of, of suicide prevention and suicide risk. Thank you. I know, I think we've covered most of what's come up in the chat. If you, I wanna be sure to allow for some time. We only have a few minutes left. If um, either of you had anything additional that you wanted to share, but also make sure that we've covered, I think most of what's come through um, to us in our chat. I know, you know, a, a, 
very, very close friend of mine years ago was living a split life, um, was not out at work for a variety of reasons, was fearful that his job would not be safe if he came out, um, was a gay man in a long-term partnership, had an incredible social circle and, and group of support, but unfortunately having to live that split life took its toll. And um, he did end his life based on that inability to be integrated, to just be himself. And those of us who knew that he was walking these lines one day into, you know, and having to change in another saw him just physically struggling and tried to be as supportive and, and comforting and, and provide resources. But his work was actually in research and HIV care. And so his passion for his work and his desire to stay connected to that role kept him there, even though he felt like he couldn't be out. It was a very traumatic situation and it wasn't that long ago. And so I just, I always want to reiterate to people that um, things are not over. We are not past some of these struggles. We are not um, beyond it, right? And, and we see this a lot and I have my DNI cap on a little bit right now, but um, we're fortunate if we've seen progress, we're fortunate those of us who feel as though we can live out and loud and proud and I can throw, you know, the term wife in there whenever I feel like I want to and, and I don't fear repercussions, but that's not everyone's experience. And that also comes from my ears on this earth. And so to Lee's point, um, especially youth who do not find themselves in an environment where they truly believe they can just be who they are or still trying to figure some of those things out and feel comfortable to share that. Um, it's it's vital. Each of us on this call, each of us in this um, session can be that supportive person simply by being a listening ear, doing some research and extending ourselves. Uh, I want to make sure that I didn't miss anything and give either of you a chance to add some final thoughts. Jump in, I don't want radio silence. I mean, I guess there, there's so much to say and I hope I hope that folks that are, you know, tuning in this evening that this is a beginning and not an, a punctuation. Um, but, but one thing I would just really, really want to emphasize to professionals that are on this call, to folks that are on this call, that if, if you're a healthcare provider, if you're a counselor, you have a lot of power. You have a lot of power, you have a lot of influence. And I think that one thing that you can do is you can practice the radical act of imagination, right? And you can imagine what it's like for folks to do all the work, to come up and, and, and show up and to be with you. And I think that's, that's one thing. I think the other thing too is that given that you have power and privilege, you should use it. Right. You should use it to mobilize your connections. You should use it to unlock doors that are that seem very fundamental to you, but may not be to me. Um, and that you should, you know, also talking about law, law is law, but there's also bad laws. Right. And that, you know, we have a place to put a stake in the ground to to really move folks forward and not hold them back. And so, like. Nobody here who's who's dialing in doesn't have a line in this play. And so I just really, really invite you to um, to think about that and to think about where we are now, which is OK. And there's a world of good we still have to do together. So please use your privilege. Please use your power. And please, like, if somebody tells you who they are, say thank you and take care of it. I don't really feel like I want to add anything else to that. <laughs> I'm looking at Mark on camera going, no, he, you know, that feels like an amazing wrap up. I cannot thank all of you enough for the time that you've spent with us, for your interest, for your curiosity, for your dedication to this subject and many others I know. And so I just want to express that extreme gratitude for allowing the three of us to share who we are and um, our stories and we will um, continue the conversation as lee mentioned this hopefully will not be the end so thank you so much that brings us to the end of our event we appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us for this conversation 
We encourage you to connect with our faculty, students, and alumni by connecting with Walden on social networking sites like Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. To view additional content like this, please visit our digital events and webinars hub using the link in the resources list on the toolbar at the bottom of the screen. Thank you again to our panelists and moderator, and to you, our audience, for joining us today. Everyone, please have a safe and wonderful day. Thank you.